there have been many great teams, a proud heritage to inspire and challenge. The Canton Bulldogs, the Chicago Bears, the Green Bay Packers. But now, a new team was preparing to top them all. The Miami Dolphins had arrived. The Dolphins were born in expansion and suffered through four dismal seasons. With the fifth came a spot in the playoffs. The sixth brought a division championship. The seventh and eighth world championships. Miami fans had witnessed the building of a dynasty. A gifted young quarterback. A brilliant wide receiver. A coach who would not settle for less than a man could give a powerful fullback, a game-breaking setback, pro football's finest offensive line, and a no-name defense that personified team. As important as any player were the assistant coaches, Monty Clark, Tom Keene, Mike Scarry, Bob Snelker, Carl Tassif, and Vince Costello. Like the closely knit strands of an unbroken thread, each man blended his skill to the whole. Together, they had dominated pro football for two straight seasons. But now, the task got tougher. No team in history had ever won three successive world championships. Don Shula called it football's triple crown. And even some early storm warnings could not shake his faith. Five regulars signed future contracts with the World Football League, and a strike disrupted summer camp. But this team smiled through adversity, determined to keep internal dissension from sowing the seeds of its own defeat. The Miami Dolphins, Don Shula, and owner Joe Robbie united with a common goal. 1974 would be their year to challenge pro football immortality and dream the impossible dream. Miami opened the season with cool confidence, but when you call yourself world champion, complacency can kill you. The eager young New England Patriots were anxious for attention, and they got it by surprising Miami 34 to 24. A team can claim to be number one after beating the best. All over the league, contenders geared up to take on the top dog as a team which had lost only twice in two seasons, fell three times in 74. Miami realized that the impossible dream would not be accomplished without a bitter struggle. When you're the best, every game becomes the Super Bowl. In the dying sun of defeat, Miami learned valuable lessons. When clouds of doubt envelop, pride, determination, and character become more than cliches. They win games. In Orchard Park, New York, the Buffalo Bills opened an early lead on O.J. Simpson's twisting runs and a little luck. Although unaccustomed to coming from behind, the Dolphins remained calm and relied on basics like Larry Zonka blocking and Mercury Morris running. Miami came back to beat Buffalo, but the next week they fell 14 points behind in San Diego as an unknown rookie named Don Woods surprised everyone. Once again, Miami came back, this time sparked by a rookie of its own, receiver Nat Moore. The Dolphins scored three times in the fourth quarter, earning a victory that was too close for comfort. But all year, they specialized in heart-stopping finishes. 
With 21 seconds left, they trailed Kansas City before Larry Zonka rumbled in to save the day. While victory did not always come as easily as it had in the past, the brutal Zonka running style had not altered. But the punishing effect of Zonka's rushes worked both ways in 74, as once again the Dolphins were victims of their own success. Nagging injuries cut back on the playing time of Zonka and other key performers, as everybody took their best shot at the world champs. With injuries unsettling the starting lineup, a bow-legged rookie from Arizona State stepped in to fill the breach. At first glance, Benny Malone did not appear to be a classic pro runner. Malone was all elbows and kneecaps, but the basics were there. Instant acceleration. Exploding into tacklers. Magic in the open field. In fact, funny running Benny Malone did more than fill the breach. When times got tough, he kept Miami in the chase. While Malone made a welcome rookie contribution, more help was coming from a seasoned veteran of the bomb squad. A kamikaze named Don Nottingham, number 36, was ready when Zonka couldn't play, and he delivered an excellent imitation of the original. Malone Nottingham backfield turned out to be one you could win with. Against Baltimore, the duo combined for 206 yards and both touchdowns in an important 17-7 Miami victory. Another changeover was shaping up on the outside. Miami started the season with the proven excellence of Paul Warfield. But as yet another symbol of success, Warfield was also a marked man, and injuries kept him out of six games. To pick up slack, the Dolphins looked to reliable Howard Twilley, number 81. While Twilley's every step was studied precision, a raw rookie named Melvin Baker was just learning to harness his skills. Baker had flat out speed to go get the long ball, but sometimes he went too far. But Baker didn't slip away entirely. At season's end, he teamed with ageless Earl Morrill against the Patriots in a Miami get-even victory. While Baker had taken a whole year to find the end zone, another rookie receiver flashed brilliance early in the preseason. Number 16 was Nat Moore. He gave notice by going 80 yards in an exhibition game against the Cincinnati Bengals. When the regular season started, Moore changed his number to 89, won the Thomas Fitzgerald Award as outstanding rookie in camp, and kept right on running. Speed.
speed-burning first-year receivers are not all that rare in the NFL, but the place they test your manhood is over the middle. A timid rookie will short-arm a few in heavy traffic, but Nat Moore turned out to be talented and tough. Moore, Nottingham, Malone, all three contributed. And when it came time to improvise and adjust, reserve strength kept the impossible dream alive. In 1974, Miami came alive at night. Bright lights found the Dolphins at their best. Against the New York Jets, Bob Greasy filled the night air with footballs to tight end Jim Mandage. Miami took an early lead, but then the Jets came back behind another night person, Joe Namath. Namath brought New York to within four points. Then no name took over. All during an anxious fourth quarter, Namath kept taking shots at the end zone, and no name kept breaking them up. In the end, Miami rolled right over Joe and the Jets for a 21 to 17 victory. While 1974 had its share of struggle, the night air seemed to bring out smiles and Miami invincibility. In a twilight game against Atlanta, the Dolphins took their cue to blitz in and bury the Falcons. The offense flew on the winged feet of Nat Moore. Everything came together as the offensive line blocked and Don Nottingham blasted for a resounding 42-7 triumph. But the Dolphins' finest team effort came under the lights against Cincinnati. The Bengals had to win for a playoff spot, but Don Shula had his ball control offense back in high gear. Zonka shredded the Cincinnati defense. And when the running game turned lame, Greasy to Mandich went back on the air. The offense scored 24 points. The defense allowed just three, as Curtis Johnson scooped up one of four Bengal fumbles. Yes, bright lights brought back the good times but the Dolphin defense weathered its storms too. Injuries to Manny Fernandez and Doug Swift added strain, and the strike cut into cohesive team play. But no name worked out its problems together, and the gang tackling trademark never left. In the end, only one team in the AFC gave up fewer points, and that team was the Pittsburgh Steelers. Leading all the hitting was number 40, Dick Anderson, a mean man in the open field. Again, Anderson's running mate was Jake Scott, number 13. Scott is always around the ball to clean up loose ends. While Scott intercepted eight passes, the job of pressure fell to the front line. Defensive end Vern Denherter, number 83, anchored one side of the line. Denherter's partner at the other end was number 84, Bill Stanfill, who after preseason injuries, played himself into shape, practiced his moves, then put them to work.
Stanfield keyed the pass rush all season and led the team with 10 sacks. Linebackers were juggled, but Mike Colon stayed put on the right side and dealt out solid licks. Taking over Swift's spot on the left was Bob Matheson, number 53, from the defense of the same name. Filling Matheson's old role was Larry Ball, number 51. Ball came from one side, Matheson from the other, and Nick Bonaconte blew up the middle. As always, number 85 was no name's Rock of Gibraltar and main man on the goal line stand. Against New Orleans, the defense was perfect as Miami shut out the frustrated and unbelieving Saints 21 to nothing. Once again, the Dolphins depended on Bob Greasy and Jim Mandich for points. All season long, Greasy and Mandich worked magic with play action. A play fake would send defenders one way, then Mandich would slide the other. Sometimes the only one left to beat was an official. Greasy's play action fakes led to six Mandich touchdown catches and signaled a change in emphasis. From basic ball control in 73, Miami brought back the passing game to equal stature in 74. And as the offense opened up, Bob Greasy dusted off a few old tricks. Number 12 had not scrambled much in recent years, but now in tight spots, he used his mobility to excellent advantage. The offensive line was another unit shuffled by injury, but center Jim Langer, number 62, anchored the middle all year, providing protection for drop back passing. Out of the pocket, Reese's accuracy was amazing. Behind his line, Greasy completed over 60% of his passes and balanced the Miami offensive books, over 2,000 yards in both rushing and passing. While the world champions had their ups and downs in 1974, they still had an edge in the really big games. In the season's 10th week, O.J. Simpson and the Bills came to town, tied with Miami for the Eastern Division lead, but the Dolphins had O.J.'s number. This game would decide the division title, and the Bill defense was ready, too. With help, Bob Greasy stood up to the heavy pressure, and Miami jumped to an early lead. But Buffalo climbed back into the game on an incredible catch by J.D. Hill. The Bills' comeback tied the game at 28. Then with two minutes left and 80 yards to go, Miami did what legendary teams are supposed to do. With yet another spine-tingling finish, Miami defeated Buffalo, then went on to win the division with an 11-3 record and clinched their fifth straight playoff berth. 
The road had been rocky all the way, but that made getting there all the sweeter. The impossible dream was almost within reach. But first, a playoff showdown with the Oakland Raiders. An inexperienced Miami team had come to Oakland for its first playoff game in history. Now, four years later, the two-time world champions returned to be mocked by a black handkerchief salute. On the opening kickoff, Miami saluted back. Nat Moore's brilliant 89-yard return set the stage for one of the greatest gains in NFL history. Miami down 21 to 19 with only four minutes left. The determined Dolphins came back one more time. The impossible dream had ended. A classic struggle had run out of time with Oakland on top, 28 to 26. But there was no disgrace in defeat. Miami accepted their loss as they had welcomed their victories with dignity and heads held high. Don Chula looks toward the future for the Dolphin dynasty did not die in Oakland. New goals await to be set and accomplished, and dreams for the future are the grandest of all. <laughs> 